Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for this afternoon's session on China's resource appetite. My name is Nicholas Davis. I am a director here at the World Economic Forum. And as you may know, the forum has worked uh, very hard over the past few years to look at the interconnections between resource issues and environmental issues uh, around the world. And as we know, China being such an important player economically, politically in the world, I think it's, it's fitting that here in esteemed company, we have the opportunity to explore the issue of those links uh, within the Chinese context. If anyone is interested in discussing this more and the forum's work, please don't hesitate to come and grab me after the session. But in the meantime, I leave it in the very capable hands of Vijay to take us through uh, what will no doubt be uh, an exciting and informative session. Thank you, Vijay. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, good morning or good afternoon at this point, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Vijay Vaitis Warren. I'm the China Business and Finance Editor for The Economist and uh, author of a new book on global innovation called Need, Speed, and Greed. And particularly excited not only because it delves quite a lot into the question of the resource nexus, the food, energy, water nexus, as the World Economic Forum has called it, but because a Chinese edition is going to be launched very soon. So uh, that makes uh, me happy. I hope you'll have a, a chance to pick it up and, and challenge me on the ideas within that book. I would, be well, I would welcome your comments to learn what you think about resources and innovation. Um, without further ado, uh, let me delve right into the topic of today. Chinese resource appetite, or China's resource appetite. Um, why are we here to talk about this? You know the mega trends of the 21st century. The world faces extraordinary challenges, some grand global challenges. And if we look at uh, beyond the short-term concerns of the last decade that have tended to preoccupy the world's governments, uh, I and mean, those are important concerns, things like terrorism post-September 11th, uh, things like the global financial crisis post-Enron and post-Lehman Brothers, and what to do about the euro. These are important concerns, of course, but they're not novel. If we look back a thousand years, political terrorism has been with us. It's not a new phenomenon. And equally, capitalism in crisis, I challenge you to tell me a time when capitalism wasn't in crisis. We can go back to the tulip bubbles or the South Sea manias of yore. Right? So these are new to every generation, but they're not new in the way, for example, uh, the resources challenge uh, confronted by climate change, where we may have irreversible triggers uh, in that environmental problem uh, that would make it impossible to revert to a state uh, in, for which uh, life is habitable for, for humanity. The Earth will do fine, but the species on it, like us, may not. Um, and so there are certain kinds of challenges we now face because of the change, the wave of demography uh, that is transforming uh, the world, the uh, geographic changes, the economic change with the rise of China, India, BRICS, and soon the civets economies, and behind them an acronym that hasn't been coined yet. There'll be many more. We're living at an extraordinary age, an inflection point in many ways. Um, and at the heart of this, the crucible of that change and tension is China. And resources lie right at the heart of that. There are a lot of myths, a lot of exaggerations, but also there are genuine concerns and problems that we have to work through in a thoughtful way. And to help us do that, uh, we have an extraordinary panel who I will introduce uh, in due course. A couple of the ground rules for today. We want this to be a very participative panel, so there'll be no speeches. I, I'm very pleased to say that our um, uh, uh, good gurus, our politicians, and our, our company chairman and academic experts have promised no speeches from the, from the stage, and I'm going to keep them to that. But equally, I want all of you involved. So I'll turn to the audience quickly um, in the process for your questions. Make them good. Make them provocative. Make us earn the microphone here on stage. But equally, no speeches from the floor either, right? Nobody likes a gas bag. So let's, let's keep this a high-level debate the way that the World Economic Forum uh, event should be. That's what I ask of you. And we thought it would be uh, interesting and fun to start with a vote. Uh, and now all of you will find voting uh, devices on your chair. If you don't find one, wave your arms and somebody will come around and give you one or grab one from the next chair. Um, and the way this is going to work, we're going to ask you two questions right now. You'll see, the, you'll see the screen, we'll display them in just a moment. We'll answer them. And this is a forced choice. Um, no choice to abstain or sit on, you know, sit on the fence. Um, there's a saying in uh, American politics, uh, don't be a mugwump with your mug on one side of the fence and your wump on the other. I think my, my uh, 
a friend from Connecticut. I'm actually uh, from the state of Connecticut where Governor Malloy is from. may appreciate that old uh, axiom. So please, go ahead and vote. Uh, the first question, do you believe China's yeah. high economic growth rates in the past have come at an unacceptably high environmental cost? Again, we're starting by looking to how we got here in the past. Please go ahead and vote. Now, I'm not getting any indicator of uh, staff uh, that people have voted. Um, it, the voting is done? Okay, great. So they've gotten your votes. Let's go to the next slide, please. Do you believe that China's current policies will sustain high rates of economic growth that are compatible with sustainability and environmental protection? So we're looking at how, where we are today. Just to be clear, how we got here was the first question. Where we are now is the second question. Okay, great. We've got your votes. Thank you very much. We're not going to tell you what the answers are. We're going to keep it a secret until the end, and we'll look at them together to see how opinion has changed, okay? I thought we'd have a bit of fun with this. Great. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let me turn to my first speaker. Um, we're going to have, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Lin Bochiang, Director of the China Center for Energy Economics and Research at Xiamen University, and a great expert on energy here in China. Um, let me ask you, just to, to lead us off here, um, can you talk about whether the relationship between uh, government and the private sector uh, is working in terms of uh, resource management. I know you've done a lot of work on this. How do you see that tension, and what do you think we should do better? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> to answer this question is actually not that easy. Uh, just in fact, uh, the two questions just posed uh, a moment ago, to answer those two questions also not so difficult, not so easy. It depends on how you look at it from different angles. So uh, let me uh, make it uh, brief. I believe that the, the partnership between the public and private sector are extremely important in managing resources. We all know that given the China's population base of 1.4 billion, uh, the, all the resources and current uh, per capita is still very low. All the resources in China is going to be scarce. Uh, there's no question about it. We don't Can you enough. hear him in the back? Is there any problem? <clears throat> You're okay? A little bit higher. Okay. Bit okay. Uh, we don't have enough. Uh, that's for sure. But moving forward, how are we going to deal with this issue? Uh, that's where the public and private own partnership coming in. I think the government should really create an enabling environment uh, to make sure that the private sector participation in the in the management of the resources. By saying that is that I don't want the government to step in the pub private sector's shoe like intervene in the market, like provide the excessive subsidy, that kind of stuff. Uh, because we all know that the resource has been heavily subsidized by the government or by next generation. Uh, put that in perspective that the government should uh, really kick in the reforms in terms of energy, in terms of resource pricing, also uh, try to design a better subsidy system that such that we don't have over-subsidized and do that too much damage to the next generation. The private sector should be the main driving force for technology innovation and management system, such a kind of uh, effective model in management the, the, the resources. So, so, so if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, when you talk about public-private partnership, um, when I heard that you, you know, this was something you were, wanted to talk about, slightly my heart sank because uh, I think we've all been to discussions around the world on public-private partnerships uh, where that's an excuse for not doing very much. Uh, for having talk shops, but you actually not only have something to say, you have something quite radical to propose. Um, when you say public-private partnership, um, you're actually talking about um, the state retreating and the market advancing, if I may use a local phrase. Uh, that's what I'm hearing. Is, is that fair to say? That's correct. Okay, so well, here we go. A bold opening comment um, from uh, a leading energy expert. Uh, we'll be sure to pick up on this theme uh, as we go forward, but uh, I'm very pleased that um, you, you, I have a strong leadoff hitter, hitter here. Um, uh, let me move next to Peggy Liu, uh, chairman of Juice, which is a, an NGO that has uh, some very innovative things going on that Peggy will probably touch upon, uh, but it, it stands for Joint U.S.-China... Collaboration on Clean Energy. Collaboration on yeah. Clean Energy. Um, uh, and also she's a young global leader. Uh, so, Peggy, um, I touched on this in just the opening comments, but urbanization. Um, China is maybe two, three years behind the global trend to becoming an urbanized society. China, maybe a few months ago on official statistics, 
became an urban society for its first time in history. But on every other metric, it's going to outpace the global pace. Uh, this is going to be an extraordinary continuation of an extraordinary migration of the kind that hasn't been seen in human history. Um, can you give us your perspective on whether this is happening as a leapfrog that has been posited, like happened with mobile phones in Africa and so on, towards a sustainable resource um, uh, accommodating a uh, new kind of infrastructure of urbanization? Or is, is it mostly replicating some of the unsustainable exurban sprawl models that are seen in, in developed countries elsewhere? Uh, where do you come out on this? So just to give you some context, China is in the middle of a 40-year period of urbanization. Um, we're about 22 years into it. And during these next 20 years, you can expect that we're going to build 50,000 new skyscrapers. Um, I think The Economist said we're building the equivalent of a Rome every two weeks. Uh, you can see 100 new uh, airports, 170 new mass transit systems, um, just a lot of fixed asset investment. And so it's really imperative that China leaps frogs to build sustainable cities. JUICE as an organization has been training government officials, central level and local government officials through party training schools on how to build sustainable cities. Um, different modules from uh, energy master planning to transportation to eco-heritage tourism, water and waste uh, treatment, etc. And what we've found is, is that China has something very unique, a, a couple things that are very unique going on. One is that it's piloting new technologies um, across multiple cities. So any technology you can name, electric vehicles, LED street lighting, uh, carbon trading emission schemes, etc. China's central government is basically designating anywhere from 6 to 30 of these cities to pilot them. It's almost like they're throwing spaghetti on the wall and doing experimentation at mass scale. If any one of these models uh, becomes viable, then they can easily scale that across the country. No other country in the world can do this type of experimentation. I think that China is inventing the urban future, and it's doing it by embracing international best practices, international technologies, um, and, and it's incorporating it into the way uh, that China can develop, so China can digest it. The second one is this, this training mechanism. is very unique. I've never run into anything like it anywhere around the world. So the Central Organization Department has eight training academies, and every government official of a certain level or above has to take 12 days of training every year at least. And they choose the courses that they take. So the, the students that uh, learn with us want to learn about sustainable cities. So this is a, an amazing mechanism to take best practices and scale them very, very quickly in a very in-depth way to explore solutions uh, in, in a way that they can then implement them locally. So central targets that exist, numerical, numerical targets for energy efficiency, water uh, pollution reduction, um, reforestation, and all these things, all these great things, can then be implemented by these local leaders. And so China has some very unique advantages. I'm very hopeful that uh, China is inventing the urban future in a way that will leapfrog. Um, Peggy, you've given us um, a very different picture from our first speaker. Um, you're, you've talked about the dynamism of uh, the government structure and especially of local government structure, um, and you've given us a picture of a system that has uh, got the capacity to, to run lots of pilots, um, to see what works, that has a tolerance for risk, and that ultimately, um, you say, has the ability to scale what works. Um, and, and those of you who are from a venture capital background or, or who follow innovation um, studies know that that's a lot of the characteristics of what defines innovative companies or innovative ecosystems, uh, these components. But you're talking about a centralized government, right? So I just want a reality check here um, uh, and, and maybe push you a little bit. This is the theory. We all know about the pilots, right. but the essence of this, the proof is in the pudding. Give us a, a couple of examples of when pilots happened, failures were allowed to fail, and the successes by ind you know, independent measures, successes were actually brought to China scale in the sustainability space. Um, and, and we're not interfered with by the usual problems of elite capture, government, subsidies. We all know some of the, the challenges involved with government acting like a market actor. Well, I, let me start with failure because that's always a good place to start. I think um, coal to liquids has been one of the failures uh, in terms of not being commercially viable. But they've put in hundreds of billions of dollars into that. However, smart grid, um, I think, is 
uh, an example of success. So, you know, they... they what's, um, what's happened for those of us that don't know in the audience? What's actually happened with Smart Grid? So five years ago, JUICE as an organization led a coalition of international experts to um, work with decision makers, namely the state grid, um, to see how smart grid could benefit the electrical grid here in China. And in 2009, they announced a, a roadmap to implement smart grid across the country by 2020. And they um, put $7.2, I think, billion dollars behind that. And now I think that's probably doubled, and there's a lot of private market investment uh, behind that as well. And they, I, I think there was at least 15 local city pilots that were told to figure out how to deploy smart grid. So, you know, again, spaghetti on the wall. We'll see where that goes. You know, we're not yet at 2020. But um, I think a lot of international experts believe, like Duke Energy, Applied Solar, they believe that smart grid will be implemented here in a compre comprehensive way first compared to the rest so of the it, world. So it's still an aspiration, just to be precise. You know, it's anything, on the way there, but we haven't yeah, gotten to scale yet. Anything with large-scale capital will take, you know, 10, 20 years to right. actually okay. realize. Okay, but I just want to calibrate expectations. So you've put forward a theory, it's a train in motion, but the train hasn't yet gotten to this destination. And there is skepticism. Anybody who wants to see the Tianjin eco-city, the Sino, uh, sorry, the Sino Singapore, Singapore eco-city, sign up with me. We're leading a tour Thursday, um, a VIP tour. I'd be happy to include you so you can see it for yourself. Okay. Um, so we've had two different visions of what's happening, and often in China, multiple things are happening at the same time. I think that's also uh, one of the, the characteristics of uh, understanding right China. Right um, but let's, um, let's go from what we've just heard, which is a, um, uh, uh, an insight into how uh, enlightened leadership can, can and push from the top down. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, Ma Jun, who's the director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs here in China. Um, I know you've done a lot of work on um, data transparency as it relates to the environmental space. Um, uh, and can you talk a little bit about that, and in particular, how that can empower from the bottom up? Thank you, VG. Um, I think throughout the world, uh, the management should start it with measuring. So data is very important for government, for the corporate world, and also for the, for the public. Uh, but it's particularly important in China in terms of environmental governance because so far, you know, when we look at China's dire environmental situation, we come to the conclusion that the first, uh, the number one barrier is not just the lack of technology or money, it's the lack of motivation. Motivation should come from the government enforcement, but the enforcement remains to be very weak and the environmental litigation is near to impossible. Behind that, it's the protection given by the local government to some of the polluting factories that they want, uh, want to have growth. So we need to, we need to have, uh, create more motivation. We need to have the broad stakeholders to join the efforts. But people need to be informed before they can get involved. With that in mind, we created uh, the, a national pollution database in 2006. And over the past six years, have compiled all this government source the information and provide it, make it easy, more accessible. And with this, you know, when people access this information, now it has put extra pressure on those companies. It's raised the, the violation cost. And so far, it has gener motivated hundreds of polluting factories on our, on our list to come to the, to, the, to the NGOs to make public disclosure about what went wrong, how they try to fix their problem, and go through the third part audit to try to prove to the public. So it generates some real change. So uh, this is very exciting. Um, and there's also, I, th I mean, one of the oldest adages in business is what matters gets measured. And the corollary to that is what's measured gets managed. Um, and it, I've always, uh, it struck me, uh, I wrote about energy and environment for many, many years for my magazine. Um, how little was well managed in terms of environment and sustainability uh, or, or until recently? Uh, in, in, among companies, among countries, in national accounts. Environmental data are often very dubious. There's often huge holes. Um, and so, uh, you know, I applaud this effort. Um, but how far can you go in China? How, um, these are public data, right? You're, you're working off public registries, as it were. Um, is there um, the experience from other markets, other countries, for example, the toxic release inventory, the TRI data in the U.S., or, um, where uh, you have uh, 10, 15 years of having public data actually lead to environmental change um, shows that it's not just the publication of that data, it's what sense you make of it, uh, are people able to act on it, 
how, what is the quality of that data. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges? You gave us the positive case. Tell us about what needs to happen to make it better. Yeah, the challenges is obviously here. China has been ruled top down for thousands of years. So transparency and public participation is not something that uh, we can easily adapt to. But, uh, but this country is going through this transformation uh, when it modernized itself. So I see that, uh, that, that this is part of the important social change, social progress made in China. And, uh, uh, but we understand the constraints. So from the very beginning, we made a huge compromise to start by using the government source, the data only. Um, but um, of course, it, you know, it helps us when all this polluting factories and even the local government uh, lobbied by them to come to pressure us to, uh, you know, it helps because it, we can all provide a, a sources, other sources there, a government sources there. But I know that this is not enough. We need to move forward. And fortunately, I think since 2003, China is, is moving toward this trajectory and uh, it culminated in the year 2008 when this, this uh, government have published uh, the open, the China's first go open government information regulation. So on the environment side, we have the environmental information disclosure measures. All this provided the basic legal framework for that, for us to operate. So we want to collaborate with the stakeholders, including the government, to move it forward. Great. Well, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about this and maybe even talk about the role of um, social networks and uh, citizen power where Chinese on a number of occasions have uh, gotten together spontaneously to block um, polluting plants, for example, in Dalian and elsewhere. But um, let's, let's move to our next speaker, um, uh, Daniel Malloy, who's the governor of Connecticut. Uh, of course, uh, like China, the United States uh, is a, a, a great nation with great challenges when it comes to energy resources, environmental conservation, um, but the state of Connecticut, uh, I'm very happy to say, is a leader in energy environment policy. Uh, give us your perspective. Um, uh, what have you perhaps learned and can share with us? Well, I, I want to begin by saying that Connecticut is an energy-constrained state uh, with relatively high cost of, of energy, uh, with pollution generated in other states primarily by the burning of coal. So there are similarities as, as, as well. Um, uh, what we're trying to do is concentrate on ultimately on cheaper, uh, cleaner, and more reliable energy, uh, and to uh, get to that by a portfolio uh, approach where, where price has to be built in uh, to decision uh, making. I also come at this from, from a different position, and, uh, and I'll mention this. I think it's ultimately imperative that the United States, North America, uh, be energy independent. I also think it, uh, for national security reasons, uh, for national, uh, 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 for international competition reasons, China ultimately has to be, and I'm not talking about in the next 150 years, but in a relatively short period of time, needs to strive to clean, uh, uh, clean its environment, needs to strive to access the, the energy that, that it needs uh, for production uh, and life uh, purposes, but ultimately must also become energy uh, independent. Otherwise, the two greatest economies in the world are destined for conflict over issues which, quite frankly, if we set our mind to it, are avo uh, avoidable at this point. Um, uh, in Connecticut, uh, we'll get our, our portion of the job done. We're a relatively small footprint state. Uh, we'll, uh, in the next three weeks, publish an energy plan that will be a roadmap for moving uh, Connecticut to cheaper, cleaner, more reliable energy. But we're only a little tiny footprint in, in, the, in the world. We have things to say about what gets done elsewhere. Uh, let me pick up on a piece. You mentioned in passing prices. Um, it's a high uh, energy cost state, um, but equally uh, the role that prices and price signals can play in policies. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you think about externalities uh, in Connecticut and uh, well, whether there are market mechanisms that can be introduced that you're well, thinking about? You know, some of the best news in North America and some of the most disruptive news in North America is, is shale uh, gas the finding of, ga uh, of gas, uh, and the implications that that will have on the development of technologies and what fuels get used in the short run and the long run. Uh, it, it, it is abundantly clear that with Canadian oil and Mexican oil and increased oil production uh, in the United States, along with shale uh, gas, uh, along with the uh, uh, fairly rapid development of hydroelectric uh, in Canada, uh, uh, North America can, in a relatively short period of time, be uh, energy in independent. Um, it appears, uh, you know, we'll have to watch the vagaries of pricing in natural gas, that that can be done 
for the United States, for North America, at a relatively low cost. Um, and and that's the, uh, that is one of the disruptive uh, factors. It's obviously very encouraging for us in manufacturing and other uh, high energy uh, consumption fields uh, and, and will allow us to be more competitive than we have been in the past. But on an international basis, it could be very disruptive. Right. Very interesting. We're going to pick up on that. Uh, let me turn to our, our final speaker, uh, Wang Wenbiao, chairman of the board of uh, Eli and Resources Group. Um, I, I believe uh, you'll be speaking in uh, Putonghua, if I'm not mistaken. So perhaps people may want to put on their headsets if necessary. Um, can you tell, um, you're a, uh, a business leader in the green economy. Can you tell us uh, what you see here? We're talking about China's resources. What do you see as the green economy? And uh, how do you see from a business perspective uh, making this a, a bigger part of the solution? Well, green economy is very important to China and to the world. It's also a great challenge. I think we should look at the green economy from two perspectives. First, um, quant qualitative innovation and also qualitative. In China and in the world, we should talk about one, sh one thing. How do we develop the economy which also protects the environment? This is a win-win situation. For China, for the United States, and for many other countries, we should think about this potential win-win solution. Through what mechanism can we realize the win-win situation? We want environment. But many environmental initiatives are uh, public service. But we also need to develop economy. Economy is uh, about business. Let me talk a little bit more about how my company is doing in this aspect. How do we develop our business but also protect the environment? Just give us one quick example because we promised no speeches. Uh, one example of what you're doing. For example, my company... For example, this is a desert. This is a desert. And uh, within 24, we use it 24 years to make over 5,000 areas be green. So this is an environmental initiative. 5,000 square meter is a big area. And on this basis, we also developed our business. We developed our business without polluting the environment. This is a very emerging business, for example, new material, a new agriculture, new energy, etc. With the UN standard or evaluation. Uh, we are actually conserving the natural resource, and in this way, we develop our business and economy. This is our model. So I think this should be a good model, which can be adopted. But we need multi-stakeholders to participate and to benefit more people. The general public should participate. For example, when we manage the desert, about 100,000 people help us to grow trees, to manage the trees. These people can benefit. It. And secondly, when we develop our business and economy, we increase its many green jobs. Altogether, we created about 100,000 jobs. This is the second benefit. And thirdly, policy. The government is very happy because I actually created an oasis for him, for example, Tianjin and Beijing. In the past, the sandstorm for Tianjin and for Beijing is from that desert area. This is a very big desert. Maybe Chinese people and even Asian people know this, but now Tianjin, Tianjin and Beijing do not have that many sandstorms. So just there's because a of concrete this. example where you found some success. Um, in, you talked about actually the individuals who were involved. And I think that's one of the themes that's emerging for me. Um, I want to uh, turn uh, to our speakers more broadly on the panel. Uh, maybe, Peggy, we can turn to you. Um, the engagement of the individual, right? We've heard um, the role of business, the partnership between business and government, uh, the role of market forces. Uh, but I, I want to hear from you um, uh, about uh, what kind of China are we going to have going forward and what role can individuals play in shaping that, uh, given that we have uh, the world's largest middle class and growing, the aspirations, as everywhere else in the world, for the creature comforts of life that are enjoyed in the West. Um, how do we achieve the understandable desire for prosperity, a better life, material goods, in a way that is compatible with the realities of resource constraints? So first, to set the context, there's a couple challenges that we're facing in China. The major levers of resource 
appetite in China are being driven by the grid, power generation, by urbanization, sorry, industry, then urbanization, then consumption. And if you think about those four, the grid is the easiest to affect because there's only two players, two, two major players, um, and then uh, five power generators. There's uh, the industry, which is easier to control because we've got, for example, a 10,000 state-owned enterprise energy efficiency program uh, that we're working on, and there's a smaller set of players. Urbanization is harder because there's so many cities, there's so many players and different nexus issues that come together in a city, but the holy grail is consumption. How do you affect, how do you influence the consumer? And in China, we have today 300 million middle class, but it's going to be growing to 800 million middle class by 2025. And in fact, the Asian consumer is going to be the biggest uh, market for con consumers in the future, and China is going to be the largest segment of that. So if each one of us then go out and live like an American or European uh, in a conspicuous consumption lifestyle, we're not going to have enough resources uh, for the planet, right? So the question is, how do we break, how do we t attack this holy grail? So JUICE, uh, our nonprofit, is working with companies like Edelman in the audience, um, getting advice from APCO in the audience, and other uh, academics, advertising agencies, media, etc. We're pulling together to, to do two things. We're, we're trying to reimagine prosperity. Uh, we're trying to create a new national identity that is inherently Chinese, overlaid on top of modern realities, but into really sustainable at its heart. Okay. So, yeah, so th sorry. this, this um, sounds like you want to um, uh, replace the American dream with something more homegrown. The China dream. Although in Chinese we call it Mengxiang, so harmonious, happy dream. But to do that, to change social norms, we need to do two things. We need to not only shape the desires and visualize it so we can easily follow it, but we also need a set of policies that um, easily shape consumers at point of purchase and at product use. So they're really two separate projects that we're doing at the same time. Visualizing what does this Chinese dream look like in our communities, health and wellness, culture and style. What does that look like so we can follow it? But then also working with cities to pilot these policies over the next several years. So welcome participation. Um, I want to give early warning to the audience. I'm going to come to you soon. So please start gathering your thoughts for good questions. Um, but let me, let me turn uh, perhaps um, uh, to Lin Bo Chiang. What do you make of the comments you've just heard? Um, and I welcome follow-on comments from my other panelists um, uh, of this idea of a new China dream um, and one in which incentives are provided to individuals, consumers, um, to behave differently. Uh, where does your vision of the state doing less and more room for the market fit into this? Are they at odds or is there some compatibility? I think that the consumers are going to play a very important role in the, in the resource management. And the reason I'm saying that is that, uh, uh, particularly in developing countries, it's very difficult for consumers uh, to really pay for the real cost of resources. And that's one issue uh, that I think that we have trouble all the time. Each time when they have an adjustment in the electricity tariff, or we find products, they are always outcry from the public. So and, the, uh, this is the, the, what economists like to call right. externalities, right? Right. The, the true cost of resources is often right. not paid at yes. the point of purchase. So therefore, the education uh, of uh, consumers are quite important. Uh, one is that uh, we have to educate consumers to let them at least understand the true cost of the resources. Why well, it's quite difficult to define the true cost, but at least we can try our best to tell consumers that if you are, have been subsidized, you have to understand that you have been subsidized. That's one. Second, uh, by educating the consumer uh, in understanding the cost, uh, we should be able to let consumers more willing to pay for the resources uh, and more willing to cons conserve the energy or other resources. What is the role of... Um externalities, taxes, or specific policies? Can you point to one or two that China needs to do more or where you see international success? Um, or can this be achieved, for example, through um, labeling requirements so that mm. a packet of uh, you know, potato chips or a bar of soap that I buy, uh, and if there's two choices, company X and company Y, one is incredibly resource intensive, the other one maybe a much lighter footprint, I might choose as a consumer to buy the one that is more eco-friendly um, just by having the information. Does that work? Yeah, I'm not quite sure that it's that close to China in terms of labeling. 
in terms of educated consumers, I truly believe there are many other areas that the government can start with. For example, the resource tax. Right now, we only apply resource tax to the to the to the oil and gas, and with a very low percentage, right now, probably five percent compared to international standards, it's extremely low. And uh, we also uh, try to avoid uh, taxing the, for example, the the energy, which is the main source of energy for China, like coal. Right now, coal is still uh, almost no resource tax attached to it, very little. So moving forward, I think that I truly believe that the government can have can do something, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, reforms to ensure that the resource in China reflect the, the externality, so that environmental externality, and also what is going to happen in terms of the scale resources the impact on the future generation. So, so to labeling to educate the consumer right now, I think is. Uh, it's a deep far away as comparing to educate consumer to understand cost and we need to pay for it. All right. Um, very clear argument there. Um, uh, do I have any questions from the floor? I see a, a hand up right away in the back. Let's um, go to that gentleman. Just a couple of ground rules. Uh, please um, identify yourself, of course, and please make it a short and sweet question. Again, no, no speeches, please. I know how strict you are, VJ. Uh, this question isn't as uh, pessimistic as it sounds, maybe for Peggy, but anyone. Can, can one of you give me a sense of the proportionality of this? I mean, I, I get the feeling that a lot of good things being tried, but it feels like almost messing with the deck chairs on the Titanic, given the enormity of those 300 to 800 million uh, middle class people, the enormity of energy demands. How do you see anything 10, 20 years from now really meaningfully eating away at this huge challenge? I, I think that... Um you know, it, so again, there's sort of four buckets, right? So smart grid, the electrical grid, I think that that is the, the backbone of a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. I think that what China is doing, that, will, that, that is not messing with deck chairs. That's transformative. Um, industry, I think that if you look at the 12-5-year plan and uh, some of the cooperation they're doing with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab on the industry energy efficiency, that's not messing with deck chairs. The $372 billion that they just put in over the next three and a half years on energy efficiency and uh, uh, reduction of pollution um, in investment, I think that's not messing with deck chairs. <laughs> Right. Um, it, urbanization, they just put um, $126 billion into more subways, subway development. So we're going to have four and a half, four, a little bit more than four times uh, the amount of subway lines that we do now in 2020. So 7,000 kilometers in 40 different cities. Uh, not messing with deck chairs. But consumption is a little bit harder. Um, the only example that I can give is the banning of the free plastic bags in 2008. Um, I, I, the exact numbers might be a little bit off, but it, I think in the first uh, two years, they reduced the number of pl thin plastic bags used in grocery stores by over 20 b billion. I think it was 24 billion or something like that. So small nudges, huge scale impact. Majun, a follow-on comment? Yeah, follow-up. Uh, I think uh, Peggy talks about the China dream, and I yeah, agree with that. And uh, but. But when our people watch uh, the rising middle class, watch the Hollywood movies, they do want American dream, the big suburban um, house and uh, big cars. And so we do see uh, another trend. But in the meantime, you know, there's a, such a uh, many surveys found that the Chinese consumers are the have the strongest desire to go green. I mean, the reason is quite clear. We have, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people exposed to badly polluted air, water, drinkable water. It's about the food. You know, 12 million tons of, uh, of food products contaminated by heavy metals each year. This is about the health of themselves and their children. So there's a, such a strong desire. But we need to, you know, as Professor Lin said, we need to give them the, uh, the, the, the information. You know, we need to educate the consumers. We need to give them the choice. With that in mind, a whole group of uh, 21 NGOs uh, formed the, the Green Choice Alliance in the year 2007, calling on the consumers to pay attention to the pollution discharge during the manufacturing process. Of course, we understand it's still hard to mobilize hundreds, you know, mi millions of consumers at this moment. So we decided the first step is go toward the big brands, you know, because the brands are sourcing in a massive way in China. Not for the for their production for their selling in China, but also for the for the selling in the whole Western world. So if they can change 
they can mobilize hundreds or sometimes tens of thousands of, con of, of their suppliers to, to change. At this moment, uh, this Green Choice Alliance has been expanded to 42 NGOs. Now, several, you know, it has been engaging with uh, more than 50 major global brands uh, to try to, you know, many of them started, like Walmart. Every month, Walmart will compare its list of, uh, of suppliers, more than 10,000 of them, with our list of violators. The, the list, our list is uh, 100,000. So they compare the two lists. When they identify problems, they will call them saying that you got to change Otherwise, you know, your, your uh, order will stuck in the computer. So that motivates more than 100 of their suppliers to change behavior at this moment. So I think we need to broaden, we need to expand that, that initiative. The work you're doing with supply chains is, is absolutely fascinating. I think that's a lot of how the, the guts of business actually changes. So I, well, I'm sure we'll all like to hear more later. Let me add one more up. point yeah. to uh, follow up on this question. Uh, I think that we have to look at this thing with what looks good. And what does not look good, but has a large impact? Well, all the smart grip, all the distribution of energies, all the wind power and solar, they look real good. But in reality, how much could it have impact on China's resource situation at this point? If somehow we can manage to educate, educate consumers, more understanding the cost, more willing to pay, such that we can adjust the resource tax upward, we can adjust the resource price upward, then the impact during this development stage will be far more huge than what we are uh, keep talking about, those uh, clean energies. If you look at those, they are very small. So you're, the, you're, you're the, clearly a big believer in the power of incentives. Precisely. Spoken uh, as a true economist. Right? Yeah. If you look at the wind power, wind and solar, it's less than 2% in China and has been tremendous growth. It's still less than 2%. The coal provide 80% of electricity, 69% of the primary energy. If somehow we can manage to get a little bit excess demand out of coal, then we achieve almost uh, a lot of more achievement than compared to those are uh, uh, the good. But what, what we are doing to ask people to pay for the coal, to pay a high price for coal, is difficult. It, it's not, it doesn't look good. It's but, politically uh, difficult. But it has an impact. Right. Um, we have a question here from the front row, and then we'll go to the lady in the back next. Um, please, a short question. Yes, uh, my name is Lee Lam with Savik, uh, one of the biggest uh, petrochemical company, 70% uh, owned by Saudi government. And uh, my question is about construction and automotive, because among many other sectors, we supply major materials to this particular two sectors. We talk about that, the, the China-American dream to have Villas, that doesn't work. So it seems to me the majority of the Chinese consumers are comfortable with high-rise building condos. That's fine. But every household is obsessed to have a car or two cars or right. more cars. So, so your question is, what so do we do the about the question is, car? you know, you look at the, uh, you know, what is, when is enough? Right. You know, what the government's role to play okay. to c curb this frenzy demands. So Thank oh, you. who wants to pick this up? Um, I can do that. Okay. Let me uh, say just a very brief. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that the, 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 we got a problem. In fact, that uh, we don't need that much, actually. But this inherently designed in a system that such that resource is not sustainable. We have market economy. If you ask company what's the most important, it's to sell, right? And if a human design, which is almost unlimitable, it manages to force together, it points to a direction which is resource is not sustainable by itself. So what we need to do is that how we're going to break these two forces when they meet each other, such that we create a huge demand. We have uh, something we don't need. For example, two cars. One car is enough. So, so putting all those together, I truly believe that the government, uh, in terms of resource management, really need to have a system approach. And what I'm trying to say is that you need to balance the cost, security, and security, supply, and also the sustainability had to be balanced. And by doing this, we need to have a good planning and a transition, a slow transition from one to the other. For example, the solar power, we have a huge incremental in the last few years, and now the whole system is almost collapsed because the market's not there. So we create a, a lot of waste but in the between. But to the gentleman's question, everybody wants a car, right? It's an aspiration. Um, 
Are you going to tell them no? Will policy forbid it? Is that part of the answer in China? Probably not. Can you so use that, your prices, your favorite argument? That's price, right. it, price it. I mean, that's what's happening in, in the big cities, right? Uh, it costs almost $10,000 to get the permission to have a car in the big cities like Shanghai or Beijing on an auction system, and we'll get even more. Singapore has used that to great effect, so perhaps price signals. But may I offer a thought um, that um, people's aspiration, maybe a car because that's what we fixate on today, but Henry Ford, the great industrialist, actually said, I I'm not going to ask my customer what they want. They'll tell me they want a faster horse. And he found a way to mass produce something better, a car. And I would put to the audience, just as a thought, that what people really want is mobility. And the car happens to represent that based on current means of production and what's available. But you could imagine integrated transport systems. You could imagine car sharing. You can imagine other modes. And high-speed rail can play a role in that. If you can meet people's aspirations for convenient mobility, we may be able to get to other models here in China that we haven't been able to do in the West, where we're burdened with legacy assets, legacy infrastructure, but particularly legacy mindsets. Now, there's a lady who's been very patient in the back, and I see a few more hands, and, and not enough time. So let's get a microphone here. I did promise her a question. Is it still relevant, madam? Okay, great. Please, a short question Hi, and I short answers. You bet. I live and work in Africa, which hel is oh, helping... What's your name, please? Christine Pearson. I... I live and work in Africa, and China, uh, which helps satisfy uh, China's insatiable resource appetite. What is China's responsibility in terms of environmental policy, say if it's drilling for oil in Angola, or diamonds in Zimbabwe, or coal in Zambia, or cutting timber in Liberia, for example? Great question. Somebody want to take this up? Yeah. Thank you. I think one of the reasons, you know, we, we now look at the uh, you know the the western world now the basic you know climate change is a, is a challenge but the local environmental problems pollution problems got more or less quite stable at that at that time uh, at that place i've uh, been to connecticut and uh, the air quality is said to be not very uh, the best in america but still it i see blue skies almost every day but not i mean in china a lot like in china it's so one of the reasons of course there are many many efforts, you know, pollution control efforts. But the other side of that is the, you know, the, uh, the migrating of all these polluting industries. Uh, you know, I, when I study at Yale and uh, the last, uh, I think, the, uh, uh, some, some iron steel uh, smelters got transported to China uh, to rebuild here. Just, uh, you know, now China is the, the, the workshop of the world. And uh, I think can China, now China is trying to upgrade our, our own uh, industry. And in the meantime, you know, because we are the manufacturers, so we need all these resources, not just for our, to meet our own demand, but also for re-export all this, actually. Right. Process yeah, but, that. But and let, let me stop you. You're describing uh, what has happened. But um, let's fast forward, just in the interest of time. What do we do about it, right? I mean, it's, as you say, this is economic history. It was, it was ever thus. We, um, need to, we need to grain the global supply chain. You know, we cannot allow all this, uh, uh, all this uh, polluting pollution to, to migrate from one place to another. You know, China cannot follow the old way, like the Western countries, you know, to go to other, you know, Is there resources a mechanism you can world. propose or anything concrete? Because yeah, it seems I, to me the nature of the global economy... I think the, is, the global economy have go, you know, the, the economy have go globalized, and, but not the environmental governance. You know, the, our monitoring has not gone globalized. At this moment in America, you have TRI. In, in Europe, you have PRTR. You know, people can access all this information and monitor the performance of, the, of all these uh, uh, discharger emitters, but not in China, and now started in China. I hope that uh, you know, now some of the polluting factories starting to migrate to the ASEAN countries and to other places. Now we need to globalize that uh, uh, monitoring system as well. Great. There's a possibility for that. Thanks well, to think, the progress. I think um, for the WEF staffers here, there's a, a rich role for the uh, Can I say a little bit? to play in that dialogue. Sir, please go ahead. Well, we have been talking about the environmental protection and its relationship with consumption. Well, we've been talking about how to conserve energy, reduce emission, how to protect the environment in this way. This is correct. These are good proposals. China is doing this. The America is doing this. The whole world is doing this. Having said this, we should jump out of the box. 
We should have a new perspective. Just now, Mr. Mar mentioned the globalization of environmental management. I agree with this proposal. The, uh, we have been talking about, we have been negotiating over the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Let me give you a data. This year, every year, CO2 emission around the world is about 30 billion. And um, we could only solve 10% by conserving energy. The remaining 90% should be solved by green trees, green land, etc. So the data is there. So we cannot solve the problem just through our own effort. But we have a now, there are so big desert around the world. If one-third of the desert can be turned to a forest, a greenland, then the emission, or the emission every year can be reduced dramatically. For my country, now the green area of my company is just one uh, out of 7,000. If we have 7,000 companies working on 7,000 deserts, then we would not need to talk about climate change. We would need, of course, we sh should still talk about energy conservation, but this problem is partly solved. So this is a big problem. Let's green more trees, grow more trees. Let's get more green land. In this way, let's turn deserts into green areas. You cannot change the ocean. The only area we can work is the desert. Thank you. Um, both an inspirational tale from the bottom up of what private sector can do, but also I think points to a a uh, point that's uh, sometimes forgotten in uh, some of the dis discussions, we, uh, we tend to focus on the energy system looking at the production of forms of energy, sometimes distribution, uh, but a quarter or more, of course, of climate change arises from land use and land use changes, and so there is an important area to play, including from the private sector, in thinking about that. Um, we have very little time, but I will take a last question from the lady here, if you can, um, in, the, in the third row, uh, if you can make a quick comment. Uh, um, that's sorry, but quick question and a quick comment from our panel. It's actually a quick uh, feedback from the consumer side. I mean, but it's going to be a question, my, right? More of a feedback, but you can maybe talk on. Right. My name is Mara. I'm from the China Entrepreneur Club, but I give a feedback on term, uh, uh, like from a perspective of a consumer. As I think, as a consumer, we think that the role of government and uh, uh, business, especially the government, is not to tell us what life not to live, but in or, or alternatively is to provide a prosperity, how to say, prosperity on a low-cost basis. All consumers, they want to live good, but it's not up to the government to tell us what life not to take. But it's our choices to live better on the innovation base that the uh, business and uh, government are able to provide a better life on the base of low cost of uh, energy. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I will um, tut tut you for not asking a question, but I will turn it into a question uh, in the following way by not following the ground rules there. Um, Peggy Liu, um, and this might also be something that our governor may want to weigh in as, as a uh, former mayor, if I'm not mistaken, and, and member of the council mayors. Um, the, um, uh, the, you're really, in a sense, poking at the nanny state, the government, or in this case, Peggy Liu and her, her very worthy organization, telling you how to live your life. What, is, what should a China dream be? You're arguing a little from a bottom-up perspective. It should be individual choice, perhaps in the marketplace. What do you answer that? And again, as a governor who wants to lead people uh, down a sustainable path, can you, can you both of us give us a quick word on this challenge that's being issued about the individual's uh, supremacy? Yeah, I, I think that people um, in China know what type of life they want to lead. So it's just a matter of visualizing it. One of the things that we're doing is going across the country in workshops being hosted by um, Sachin Sachi or Ogilvy or uh, Shanghai Tongji University or uh, museums in Beijing, etc., and saying, what does the community look like? We want access to clean public spaces that our babies and elderly can, can live in. What does that look like? What if we had skyscrapers above 10 stories or more dedicate a whole floor to that? What if we had our low-income housing be designed in a way that shared families can share facilities, right? What if we had more bike uh, share? What if we had access to sharing goods in our neighborhoods, right? So Chinese people know what they want. They just need help vi articulating it and visualizing it, which is why we're taking the best of Western storytellers 
um, and bringing them with the Chinese experts to visualize it. Then, then what we do is we release those seeds into Chinese uh, mass, the mass audience and let them c make it come alive through social media, through Sina Weibo. Right? So I, if, you, if you're interested in more, look at juice.org, J-U-C-C-C-E dot org slash China Dream for our action plan. Right? But you, you need but to Peggy, have is, is it fair to say that, um, that this is um, a propaganda effort, a benevolent propaganda with our best interests at heart, but using the tools of fine propagandas of the past? Absolutely. I mean, it's social engineering. It right? is. But with best Western advertising, storytelling techniques, but the knowledge, deep knowledge of traditional values from Chinese people. Got it. Um, and, and Governor, very briefly, give us your perspective. Well, I, I think government has a, a role to play uh, in, in all of what we've just talked about, and that is to actually make sure that the true cost of anything is, is, is revealed. Um, and uh, governments uh, for a long time have seen their role, particularly in emerging economies, have seen their role to mask true, true cost. Uh, there, are, there is a, a, a social imperative that we drive in China, another 800 million people to, to middle class status. Well, what's the true cost of that? How is that cost spread? Uh, does government hide the cost or assume a portion of the cost without disclosing it? Uh, if it does, then it's going to uh, encourage behaviors that are... Uh, going to be driven by more con uh, uh, consumption, not less. Um, and, and, you know, I've seen this in, in, in all economies, emerging and, and, and mature. Uh, uh, what is the role of government? I would argue that the role of government is make sure that everyone understands the true and absolute cost of, of all of its policies, in, including a policy of, of pro-consumerism. And, and, of course, a great example in the U.S., um, the markets, picking up on uh, the earlier point made, uh, the markets and insurance price parts of the United States coast, for example, the Gulf Coast, um, as too expensive for flood insurance or at a much higher rates. The government subsidizes flood insurance in many parts of the U.S., as in other countries, and encourages people to build in areas that are quite expensive. So, so an example in, in the United States, just to make the point that I'm talking about, is, is uh, packaging. Packaging has changed radically uh, in the United States as a result of the decision made uh, to, to expose the, its cost. Uh, and all of a sudden, we, we figured out that you could have a fraction of uh, the plastic holding water that, that we used to have hold water. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, two counterpoints to the question raised from the floor. Let's go to that question. We're coming right at the end of our session. Um, let's see. Uh, having those two questions put up on the, on the uh, screen again and having you vote, um, if the, uh, the conversation has moved the needle at all. So do you believe China's high economic growth rates in the past have come at an unacceptably high environmental cost? Please vote now. Okay, so we're seeing more or less uh, the same. The past hasn't changed, thankfully, in the last hour. Let's see what the assessment of current policies is. Let's have the second question, and do you believe that China's current policies will sustain high rates of economic growth that are compatible with sustainability and environmental protection? Please vote. And again, we did hear some disagreements on the panel uh, about the role of government, the role of markets, uh, the role of top-down solutions versus bottom-up empowerment. And so let's see what people thought. How many are more optimistic? than they were before, or vice versa? Okay, so we, have, we, we clearly, the trend line is, is, is clear. that We may have lost a few in the disagrees, but still, a strong degree of skepticism remains in the room. Uh, so it looks like, I think, our experts here from business, from the private sector, uh, from government, um, we have some work to do. Uh, and I think they would welcome you in joining them in, in rolling up your sleeves and helping them build China's sustainable resource future. Thank you all very much. Please give them a round of applause.